Hello, 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 everyone. I hope that you had a good day. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday night midweek prayer meeting and Bible study. Tonight, we're going to be talking about God drew the plans. He drew the plans. And I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to this particular lesson because it is going to be a good one. Why is it going to be a good one? Because we're going to be talking about a whole lot of illustrations in this lesson right here about God drew the plans. And look, if you don't have this lesson, you need to get it. Look at what it looks like on the inside. You can get a hard copy by ordering them, or you can just go ahead and follow online. We're going to have the link for you in the bottom of the description, not just for this lesson, but for all of our lessons. And we want you to go ahead and share these lessons. Make sure right now you go ahead and you share this broadcast with somebody. Share it on your page. Share it to someone. Put it in a direct message. Go ahead and share it with somebody. It's easy, 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 easy. We want to thank you for joining us. Why do we say that? Because you could be anywhere else. We know that you could be anywhere else, but you are with us tonight. So please don't forget to like and subscribe. We want to welcome our live viewers and we want to welcome our replay viewers as well. We meet here every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and on Saturdays at 11. So we're here virtually on Wednesday nights, 7 p.m. But on Saturdays, we're live and we broadcast in the same place. So do me a favor right now in the chat, in the chat, in the chat. I need you to go ahead and I want you to put in the chat what you're thankful for. Put what you're in, the, what you're thankful for in the chat and also put what you want as far as a prayer request. Why do we say that? Because every Thursday, like I've been doing for the last month and some, some weeks, I'm fasting for you. I'm fasting for the church. I'm fasting for myself, my family. I'm fasting for families. I'm fasting for friends. Hey, I'm even fasting for a few enemies. But look, I'm fasting on Thursdays, and I need you to put your prayers in the chat, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on our website, abneychapel.org, or whether it's here on YouTube. So I need you to go ahead and put that in there. We're getting ready to go and start our prayer, uh, our prayers, uh, just in one second. So make sure you put, you put those in because Elder Clark is going to be going ahead and praying for us. So remember, put in the chat what you're thankful for. Put your prayer requests because we want to make sure that we pray for you. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bishop. He's going to go ahead and he's going to lead us out in a word of prayer. We want to just say thank you once again for allowing us this opportunity to come together. We just ask, Lord, that as those who are putting the names in the chat and they're reaching out by email and on the website, Lord, we ask that whatever the name may be, that you bless it. Bless it, Lord, to the fullness of what their desires may be. And we ask, Lord, that you would continue to bless this ministry. Bless it in a way in which we've never seen before, Lord, to expand and grow and spread the word across this great city, across this great state, and across this inner tube, this internet with YouTube. And we just ask, Lord, that you will allow the message to go from here to beyond in different countries, wherever it may be seen, in different corners of this great nation that we live in, Lord. We know that there are a lot of people that we can touch and reach through the word. We just ask, Lord, that you allow that to be maintained. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Thank you Elder Clark, for that. We're going to go ahead and jump into our, our message for tonight. As we have mentioned that our lesson is on, uh, like we mentioned, is on uh, God drew, drew, drew the plans. Now, Bishop, we got to, we gotta, I'm a, I'm a, I see why you said that. <laughs> Bishop, hey, his name is just took up all over the place. D all over the place. Don't want to share with nobody. All right, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me switch that. Let me edit. That's why, hey, so y'all can't hear him because I got him muted because we got a bad echo. But look, he said, can you go ahead and change the name? And he knew it was too long. <laughs> he knew it was too long. All right, there we go. Let me, let me go. All right, there we go. We got it. So, all right, yeah, bust it. All right. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> All right, we, we're a lot better now. So let's go ahead and, and jump right in. Um, I'm going to, here's how, how we're going to do this. Like we do, we've been doing it the last few weeks 
is I'm going to take four, and then Bishop will let you take the next four, and Aaron, you take the next four. And we'll talk about it after each one um, because this is a very interesting lesson. So let's go ahead. Let's switch it up. Um, you're going to see a couple different screens, so be paying attention. Um, in fact, what we're going to do is let's switch it up to, to this screen right here, and then that way we can go ahead and we're going to get rid of that one right there. We can go ahead and we can see it. In fact, I don't even like that one. Let's switch it to this one right here. There we go. That's a little bit better. All right. You can see us and you can see the lesson at the same time. So let's go ahead and let's look at it. Number one, well, number one, what we have is um, the, the, now let me go ahead and set the stage. So we're talking about God asking Moses to build a sanctuary, right? Now here goes the, the whole background of the thing. It, it, Israel has come out of Egypt. So one country's come out of another country. Egypt was was uh, uh, the, the, the world kingdom of the day, day. And Israel lived in Egypt and they were there as slaves, right? So they're slaves, but God went ahead and he delivered them. He delivered them from uh, Egyptian bondage. And so since he went ahead and delivered them from Egyptian bondage, um, now there's at, they're at a point where yes, they've worshiped God. Come back to you, Bishop. They've worshiped God. And not only did they worship God, but God is actually asking Moses to build a sanctuary. Why is he doing that? He's saying he wants them to build a sanctuary because he's trying to teach them about the plan of salvation. All right. So please, in everything that you're doing, um, don't forget the fact that he's trying to teach them about the plan of salvation. In other words, how it is that God actually saves us, how he actually saves us. So you're going to be reading and you're going to be seeing a few different things. You're going to be seeing um, furniture. You're going to be seeing rules and regulations. You're going to be uh, um, seeing um, different lessons as to how and why he did it. And look, don't miss the point. People always say, oh, that was done away with. Yeah, we don't have to slay lambs and sheep and anything anymore, right? But look, he's trying to teach you about salvation. How are you going to be so quick to just say, we don't have to do that no more? <laughs> you know, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to get away from the moral law of God. You, don't, you want to break them Ten Commandments. That's what that is. So so let's, let's just get that out the way and let's stay focused on what it is that we know God is actually trying to show. He was trying to teach Israel about salvation. And I'll, I'll say this and we can jump into it. So what, what ended up happening is remember uh, Israel had at one point almost forgotten completely about the law of God. And I can prove it. The Bible says that when Moses first went to Pharaoh, Moses has said, hey, you know, let him go, let him go. God says, let him go, let him go to the, into the wilderness three days journey so they can worship him. And what ended up taking place is people started learning more about the law of God. So what they started to do is they started to keep the Sabbath. And in keeping the Sabbath, Pharaoh was upset and said, Moses, why do you keep the people from their work? And so that was where the whole story came up where he was like, hey, I want you to make sure that you put these people to work. He had the foreman and he had the taskmasters coming down on them hard. He says, now you guys got to make bricks without straw. And that was where the whole thing came from because they started to keep the Sabbath. So Pharaoh wanted to accuse them of being lazy. He's like, you're lazy, you're lazy, get back to work. And so when they realized that they were uh, not going to have it easy, you know, they had seen the miracles. When they realized that God you know, was there, but it was going to be rough. What ended up taking place is they got mad at, at Moses and Aaron and said, you put a, a whip in their hand and you now you make us stink in his in his in his eyes. And so. He's going to really come down on us hard. So they had to make brick without straw. So they had lost the knowledge of God. Now God is trying to reteach them through lessons, through the Red Sea, through the manna, through the water out the rock, uh, through the sanctuary services. And so now we're, we're really focusing on more so on salvation and God's provision and trust and the fact that Jesus is coming. So the Old Testament talks about he's coming. The New Testament says that he's here. So let's do this. Let's go ahead and let's jump all the way. You know, one day when I get big time, I want to use a mouse and a cursor. 
Uh, you see me looking over this way because I'm looking at my computer trying to find it. Um, but let's go ahead and let's jump all the way into the actual lesson itself. And so what did God ask Moses to, to build? What did he ask him to actually build? Well, let's go ahead and, and let's look at what he actually told him to build. He says, God asked Moses to build a sanctuary. He asked him to build a what? To build a sanctuary. So let's go ahead and let's look at it. The Bible says, let them make me a what? A sanctuary that I may dwell among them. All right. So that's what they had to do. They had to build a sanctuary, right? I'm not going to get into all the details. You see all this writing and everything. Go to the show notes. You can get the, 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 uh, the notes and you can see it for yourself. But what did God expect his people to learn from the sanctuary? Well, he wanted them to learn a few things. He says, your way, oh God, is in the what? In the sanctuary. Your way is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God and, and, and as our God? So God was trying to teach them his ways, right? And then number three, from what source did Moses obtain the blueprints for the sanctuary? Where did he get the blueprints from? In other words, what was this a building, a copy of? So we got to think about it. When you build today, you have blueprints. But it's always based on a model somewhere, a 3D model, uh, a computer-aided drafting uh, model where they put a 3D model in the system. But it, uh, ideas that were in people's minds, well, we want to see what this whole thing was and where it come from. The Bible says God himself gave Moses a sanctuary. Let me say that's the new, that's not the Bible, that's the answer. The Bible says now this is the main point of the things we are saying. I was just reading this the other week. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the what? A minister of the sanctuary, right? So there we go. We see it's a model of the sanctuary, a minister of the sanctuary and of the what? True tabernacle, which who erected? The Lord, the Lord erected and not man. There are, um, there are priests who serve. Right. So we know there's priests who serve uh, uh, and they serve the copy and the shadow. All that saying there about the copy and the shadow is it's just saying that it is a symbol. Right. Copy in the shadow. So like I got a light on right here. If if you see my hand, it's got a shadow on my face and on my shirt. Right. The copy and the shadow. This is it right here. But the copy of the shadow is what you see on my shirt because I blocked the light. Right. And so what happens is God's got this copy or this shadow that Moses is building because it's a copy off of the thing that God got in heaven, right? So he went ahead and did that to serve the copy of the shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed uh, to make the, the tabernacle. And then it goes on and it says, he was about to make the tabernacle for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you in the mountain, right? Shown to you in the mountain. So we see that right there. We got our first four questions out the way. Let me see if, if anybody um, has any particular comments that they want to bring. I'm going to bring the camera back up and see if we can get some of the, 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 the panel uh, discussing yeah, this. Does anybody want to, I'm going to do this. I'll, Bishop, I'll come to you first and then I'm going to go ahead and I'll go to Arrington. So let me go ahead just listening to what you were saying about there's an, a, uh, a blueprint, a blueprint for what needs to be done so that it's easily duplicated because of the blueprint that um, God had, in, had instructed of Moses. In this sanctuary, there are going to be certain things that are going to be put in place based on the fact that this is what's in heaven. This is what you should be seeing. This is what they should be understanding. And I don't want you to concentrate on being you right now. I want you to concentrate on being the duplicate for the blueprint that I've put in place for all of you to see. All right. I like that. I got, I got caught up. All right. Let's go ahead and go to Arrington. Arrington, what you got? No, no, I'm good. Derwin and you, you all knocked it out the box. There ain't nothing else to add. It just that God wanted somewhere to dwell, build me somewhere where I can dwell. You know, I can come in and, 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 and hang out with you. Uh, all right. You know what? Let me tell y'all uh, what's going to happen here. So I got a pattern that I see with Arrington. Aaron will, Arrington will always say, oh, no, you know, it's cool. It's good. 
And then when it's his turn, he gonna he gonna he gonna blow it up, right? <laughs> you know it's true. It's it's co I got your muted. What'd you say? Y'all that, that that was good. There's nothing else you can add to that. God wanted to be with them and he 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 had Moses build a place, you know, where where he could come and dwell. Yeah. Just All think right. if he would just materialize in the camp, it would have been a lot of dead folks. <laughs> yeah, I know that's right. Well, let's do this, Bishop. We're going to come to you the next four. Let me go ahead and pull you up. And uh, we'll go ahead and let you start on this one right here, number... Oh, uh, you know what? Let's take three, because I must have did three instead of four. So I'll let you start with this one. Go ahead. Number four here. All right, so what furniture was in the courtyard? The altar of burnt offerings where animals were sacrificed was located just inside its entrance. You know, because back in the day of the law of Moses, there was there were laws that we don't deal with today. A lot of them in which, you know, hey, where, where the uh, brethren would take care of their dead brothers, wives, and things of that nature, where you would kill someone if they did certain things against you or against someone, you know, so the, the altar itself was the first piece of furniture where there were burnt offerings that were given. And then as we look further to uh, what furniture was in the holy place, there was a table and this was of shoe bread. And that represented Jesus himself, the living bread. You know, there, there's this little song that Fred does, you are the living word. You know, so, and bread of heaven, bread of heaven, a lot of things Jesus was as he walked the earth, but in, in, in God's plan, he was everything, you know, he was a carpenter, he was a ruler, he was this, he was that to a lot of people. And the blueprint, as we spoke of earlier, that was put in place was to be a representation, a representation where he was representing that living bread that whenever we take communion that's one of the things that we we say as a representation his bread his body break it in remembrance of me and then it goes on about the seven branch candlestick with this it represents jesus the light of the world the oil represents the holy spirit and the candles represent the light that's given and the altar of incense it represents the prayers of God's people. You know, as we ask each and every prayer meeting, if you have a, a, a burden on your heart where you want to give it to God, give that name to us. Let us pray for that person as well as you praying for that person because, hey, there's power in prayer. And then what furniture was in the most holy place? And this states that the Ark of the Covenant, this is the only piece of furniture in the most holy place you know, it's sort of like when you when you watch certain movies, you see where let's just say, you know, hey, with the uh, the, the uh, Egyptian tombs where you walk in and there's only one thing and you look around the room or the tomb itself and there's only one thing. And that's basically what this is, the Ark of the Covenant. It's the holy only piece of furniture in the most holy place. And it was a chest of Ar Arcasia wood overlain with gold placed on top of the chest where two angels made of solid gold between these two angels was the mercy seat now where the presence of god dwelt it was his plan to have a place that was a replication of where he resides and and where the presence of god dwelt was in that most holy place and this symbolized symbolizes God's throne in heaven, which is likewise located between two angels. If you're getting a if you're getting a view right now in your mind imagining what heaven looks like, this in itself is telling us, based on it being the blueprint, hey, we don't have to do anything different. Let's make this a home away from home for God to dwell with us in the most holy place. And what was inside the ark? You ask, it's simply the Ten Commandments. You know, these were, these were the tablets that were ascribed by God's finger in the side of the mountain and given to Moses to share with the people as he came down from the mount. 
but God wrote on these tables of stone and they were placed in the ark. And, and, and the mercy seat was above them, which signifies that as long as God's people confess and forsook sin, mercy would be extended to them through the blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat by the priest. You know, and imagine that someone loves you so much that they are signifying that love with blood, sacrifice, and then showing you because we couldn't look upon him. If we did, we'd fall dead. So he's allowing us to see a glimpse of him through the most holy place, through the Ark of the Covenant. Now, was, moving forward. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go All ahead. right. Why did animals need to be sacrificed in the sanctuary services? We wonder, as we said before, the only time we slay an animal now is to eat it. You know, we're not offering up anything for people anymore in this manner. So according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of the blood, there is no remission. And in thinking about that, God's plan is that blood will be shed. His son Jesus shed his blood for us so that we would have a right to what we see in the most holy place as a representation of God sitting between the two massive angels who are like guardians, you know, guarding the universe along with God. And whenever he, he says, hey, go, they're already there. And that's a wonderful thought to have. All right, so I'm coming back to you, man. That was so quick. That's, that, that was so powerful. You know, something you said that got me to thinking and and that was the fact that this 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 ark is in between two angels like guardian angels right and you know you got to think about it in heaven there's a real throne there's a real guy sitting on that throne and he got his he got his homeboys there <laughs> you know what i'm saying like you know <laughs> you know what i'm saying and i mean come on man these guys and then when solomon built his temple they they those, those angels they were huge like 13 14 15 feet Go, go ahead, Aaron, to jump in. Go ahead, go ahead, no, go ahead. I'm glad you said that because when, when, when Derwitz said that, those that it's 10 cubits and Solomon, that angel was 15 feet tall. It was 10 cubits in Solomon's temple. That's a bit, that, that, that kind of makes you think of the pattern in heaven. Angels are that tall. Why would you build a, 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 a something 15 feet tall? That's that's big. Yeah. Good Lord. I, I yeah. blew, it blew my mind yeah. a couple weeks ago. I was like, 10, 15 feet. Angels over yes. there. That was something. <laughs> I, 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 since, since we're talking about the, the, the height of men or angels at that point, I, I think about always the, the story of David and Goliath and the tribe that existed and then what we as humans want to talk about when it comes to uh, dinosaurs and things of that nature and, you know, I, th I think on this, you know, if I'm 19 feet tall, if I'm 15 feet tall, what kind of animal based on me today would be walking with me at 15 and 19 feet tall? I mean, it's amazing to just think. And are these the bones that we're finding? No, I gotta, I gotta jump in here on this. Look, that, that right there, like, so my son, he, he was like a dinosaur fanatic, and I read something where, like, we just went to, to the North Carolina, uh, natural museum, natural history museum, right? And they had like models of dinosaurs and whatnot. Man, these things were huge, and you know, you, you raise a very valid point. You know, like. You wouldn't want a dog the size of a horse. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Unless you were the size of a tree. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so it just shows you how God has made all of this. Everything was bigger. Even when you look at the fossil record, you can see plants that are huge. There, There is a model of a tree sloth at the museum that is bigger than a car. It is massive. And my son had read about this years ago. He kept trying to tell me about it. He couldn't find the article. And then when we walked in, he's like, Daddy, that's what I was telling you about. 
he had read about this giant tree sloth as, as tall as most people's rooms and bigger. Massive. Bone was just, I mean, the, the leg bone, the femur, massive. So, you know, God has created some things that are amazing, but it reminds me of what the Bible says that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, thought has not entered into the mind of man, that which God has prepared for them. I'm going to let y'all talk, and then we're going to go ahead. we go to Aaron. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree totally, you know, and it's just, I always imagine what it will look like, what it will be like, you know, when all these things are revealed that we have question and debate over here on earth, you know, other nation, other universes that we have no clue of that the Bible says exist. So just knowing that things exist like this and wondering what were those animals that you created that were so huge? What was the climate of that time that was so different? What, you know, what's the real taste of a grape? <laughs> you know, just the simple things, you know, to say, hey, what, when will we know? You know, just, just a little thing like that, that, that are going to be amazing. Go ahead, Aaron, and jump in there, man. No, no, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that's nothing else to say. I just can't wait. I just can't wait. I can. I just can't wait. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and go to you, and we'll let you do the next three. Well, we at nine. I think it's nine, right? Yeah. Yeah. It says, "How were animals sacrificed in the sanctuary service, and with what meaning?" I, I think the interesting thing about this Leviticus one four and eleven is that the sinner participated in it. You know, the, the sinner was to bring the animal before the priest and, and, and the priest would hand him the knife and a basin. You know, and the sinner laid his hands on the animal head and confessed his sins. So that symbolizes transferring the sin from the sinner to the animal. So the, the thing about this services was you participated in it. You know, it wasn't just the priest doing everything. You had to, you had, since I was a sinner, I had to do it and do some cutting. You know, so that's one thing about uh, number nine that just blew my mind. When I came to the priest, whether I brought a lamb or whatever, a bull or whatever, I had to participate. I had to do some of the killing, you know, so with, with verse nine. Number 10 talks about when a sacrificial animal was offered for the entire congregation, what did the priest do with the blood? And it said, what does this symbolize? And again, it goes to Leviticus 4, 16, 17. And it talks about that the anointed priest shall take the... Uh, he would bring the bull, the blood of the bull in, into the tabernacle and the priest shall dip his finger in it. And, and, and uh, seven times he's going to, uh, he was sprinkled it seven times before the Lord, you know. So, so again, after he did it, he took the, um, the blood inside the, 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 the tabernacle and he sprinkled. It's it just amazing. I can imagine how bloody it was, you know, with blood. So he was, you know, he would take the blood and sprinkle it and, uh, um, Without the shedding of blood, there is no uh, uh, remission of sin. So that, that just that just phenomenal how in, in, in the sanctuary service, how and all this represented Christ. That's the thing. You know, this was just symbolic until the true lamb would come. You know, you go to uh, number 11. It says based on the sanctuary service and what two major capacity does Jesus serve his people? The fantastic benefits do we receive from his loving ministry? And again, in reference to first Corinthians five seventeen. Christ is our Passover, uh, what was sacrificed for us. You know, and in Hebrews 4, uh, 14 to 16, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and, and help of time and need. I tell you, just reading Hebrews 4, 14, in, in, you know, in, in our brothers in the Catholic church, you know, you got to go inside a box and confess a, a, to a man who's a sinner as, as you are. But being, when Jesus died on the cross, now we go directly to the throne of God. I don't have, to, I don't even have to call the pastor. I don't have to call the, the bishop. I can go straight to him through Jesus. And he ain't going to tell nobody. <laughs> That's what I love about this. So Jesus is that represent. He's our Passover 
And he also, uh, 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 on his death, he allowed us to come before God, you know, without going through a middleman. So I, I, you just love it. You know, you just got to love that. And then it says here in 11, it says a complete life change called a new birth, which all sin of the past. That's John 3, 3, 3 through 6, Romans 3, 25. Power of, of the, uh, the power to live right in the presence of the future. Titus 2, 14. I mean, you just, if you can put those screen, those, those texts up there, you know, it says Jesus served as the sacrifice for our sin as our heavenly high priest. Jesus' death is our as our sacrificial lamb and substitute and his continual power and ministry. And, and I just want to stop right. Just remind me of John. When John seen Jesus come and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then in 80, 70, uh, 80, 31, when Jesus said, It is finished. Man, that is it. The devil is on notice. And then number 12, you just go to 12 and say, What six promises does the Bible give about the righteousness of Offered to us through Jesus, and uh, if you can just bring up twelve, Pastor, you go through eight. Said he, and, and look, check this out. He will cover our past sins and count us as guiltless. Oh, hallelujah! We were created in God's image in the beginning. Jesus promised to restore us to God's image. Jesus gives us the desires of living righteousness and then grants us His power to actually accomplish it. Jesus, by his miracle power, will cause us to be happily, happily to only do the things that pleases him. And then he removes the death sentence from us all, crediting us with his sinless life and atoning death. Man, we should be just jumping for joy for this. You know, and then F said, um, Jesus assumed responsibility for keeping us faithful until he returns to take us to heaven. It just reminded me of what he said when I go, uh, he's going to send the helper, which is the Holy Spirit. And, you know, and just want to thank God for, for sending the Holy Spirit. And with that said, I am done. All right, so Bishop, I want to hear you first. What you got? I got to say, you know, in, in listening to you, Arrington, um, and, and where you talked about he's going to count us as guiltless, you know, and, and, and we're going to be made renewed in his image and and just thinking about that you know and 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 looking at it from the perspective of of say a new believer someone that has just come in and and you know not understanding i gotta say hey i'm i'm the first to admit being truthful things like this as a person who grew up in the adventist church and believing and understanding a lot of the things of the sanctuary and their meanings have never meant as much to me now than then, you know, because you look at it and you hear a lot of people talk about the, the covenant, the, the Ark of the Covenant and the, the gold uh, angels as, as guardians, the, the table and the representation of it. But the meaning of it, you know, growing up, I was like, OK, it's there. I got you. I understand. But when you look at the significance of it, when you have lived life and you have built relationships and you have understood things, you you look at it differently. And I guess based on, you know, the things that our parents may have gone through and they were trying to tell us these things, we weren't interested in hearing. And, you know, for a long time, you put this sour taste in your mouth and you don't let it go. And then when you become of an age that you must recognize and realize these things were meant because of a plan of action, a plan that God put in place that represents what, what sort of gives us that vision or a glimpse of what things are going to be. And it's a wonderful feeling and, 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 and emotion that you can have now to accept you know, hey, that's what it's going to be like. Oh, how many times do we get ready for that first date? You know, and we we get we get ready to to go eat that that steak that we hadn't had in three months. <laughs> you know, it's like yo, you're anxious. You you feel that 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 anxiety is gone away, and you know, hey, it's coming, it's coming, and I'm going to have that. And, and, you know, yo, it's just the joy and excitement. You know, as a little kid, you you look forward to Christmas. And as an adult, you look forward to 
let the let the clouds be cracked now. You know, hey, why must we wait? You know, but the plan of action for God is it, it's amazing. It's amazing to to realize it now differently. You know, but I I don't want anyone anyone who is a a new believer to feel that it's a necessity versus just an understanding. You know, hey, we all grow differently. We all understand differently. God's plan wasn't to be a cookie cutter plan where everybody grew in the same uh, uh, rapid pace or the slow pace. He set it up so that we all get the Holy Spirit coming to us at different times in our lives where it's significant to us. And if we believe in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we know that that representation is going to be with us whether we recognize or realize it or not. Mm, I, I like that. You you got me to thinking um, about what Arrington shared with us. And I'm going to go back to the last thing that he said because it, it means the most to me. I mean, he covers us, all of our past guilt. He considers us guiltless. You said that. But then he, he goes on, he turns along, he says he's going to restore us. So he's going to fix us, right? He's, then, he, then, and he gonna think, then he's going to give us the desire <laughs> to do right. See, <laughs> I know what it is to say, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> I, I, I wish I had a witness. I know what it means. Lord, forgive me. Help me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but uh, help me not to want to say it no more, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Help me not to. And so he's he's gonna be, you know, he's gonna he gonna restore us, but he's gonna give us that desire. And then like what, what Aaron just said, the miracle is he's gonna give us the, the, the ability to happily do. So I'm gonna tell I'm gonna testify. I'm gonna testify. I'm about to tell all on myself, Bishop. So I was talking to Bishop today, and we trying to get this health thing together, right? <laughs> he know exactly what I'm about to say. So I I'm I'm in the car, and I'm like, um, I'm eating an apple right now, <laughs> and it's good, but my brain tell me it ain't right. <laughs> and so, you know, I knew where I was going. I was in the in the driveway, but I'm eating this apple, and I'm trying to do right, Arrington, but... My, my mind was like, you know what? You're sinning right now. You don't need to eat that apple. What you need to do is go get you some donuts. Go get you some Krispy Kreme donuts and quit playing games. Quit playing games with me. That's what my taste buds said. But, you know, I was, and I was telling him, I said, look, you know, I'm doing right and it tastes good. It feels good. But in my head, I want to go somewhere else. And that's how sin is. Where you may be trying to do right. It's like, I'm going to do right, but I don't like it. <laughs> but God is telling us, he's like, look, I got you. I will help you to have the right desire to do uh, the right thing. And I'll go ahead and do it. But the last thing is that he, he credits us and he takes us to heaven. So I love that. Uh, who want to go next? Who want to go next? I need to unmute you. Who want to go next? Arrington, the bishop? All right, let me come to Arrington. Let me unmute Arrington. Go ahead, Arrington. Yeah, just, just, just real quick what I was just talking about. I just give God all the praise for Jesus because when you go back and read, just think right now, when you sin, if we if, if it wasn't for Jesus, we'll be going to you, bringing our animal. It's it was bloody back then when I had to come, but now when Jesus done it, that was it. The, the, the true Lamb of God that came. So now I can come boldly to Him through God, and 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 I can. And the thing about I love about this and Him changing us is, I can tell Him anything anything of my weakness and I know it won't get out and he's gonna he's gonna deliver me at his time so I, I just wanted to throw that two cent in there you know thank God we ain't got to deal with all the killing yeah. now see that that's what I'm talking about Arrington starting to do it again he said he ain't had nothing but here it come he just gets started it's over with you know if people had to bring their animal to me you know the first thing I thought of when you said that I say like, oh I don't want to get no blood on me because you know blood splashes I'm trying to do my job and I'm bloody at the end of the day. Are you are you crazy? You know, you got blood on my new gown. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it it, it kind of shows that, you know, salvation's a messy, messy work. It's a messy job. 
And Jesus got blood all over him for you and for me. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful, grateful, grateful. But I'm also grateful that he was that sacrifice. So we don't have to do it like that anymore. You know, in those days, they looked forward to Jesus. They looked forward to him being the one to do all that because they knew he would come and he would help. Like we were talking about a church uh, a few weeks ago. Remember, we were talking about how it was when we had communion a few weeks ago. We were talking about how uh, Jesus is our apostle and he's our high priest. So he's our apostle because he rep he was sent from God to us to represent God. But then he's our high priest in that he goes to God. And he represents the people. He represents us. So I'm just grateful for that. I'm grateful. Anybody else want to jump in here? Bishop, you want to say one more thing before? Go ahead. Yeah, we can, We can. Um, you know, speaking about the, the blood and things, I, I got a funny story of before I got married to, to Doll Baby here, um, was looking to date this girl. And I invited her to church. Because, you know, hey, I'm looking for somebody who shares the same goals and all this and things like that. And I invited her to church and she didn't show. So I'm like, okay, what did I do? Then when I talked to her later on that week, I said, you know, hey, um, what happened? Her response to me made me laugh because she said, I heard y'all kill goats over there. <laughs> What? <laughs> I said, where did you get that foolishness? You know, so it's 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 from the I guess, you know, when people hear certain things about uh uh Adventists following the law of the Lord, you know, the law of the body. I'm thinking, you know, hey, they're thinking along the lines of we kill folks who do wrong things and all this kind of stuff. And for her to say that, I, it just blew my mind. I said, you know, hey, how, 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 where did that come from? And, you know, yeah, it's, it's just amazing that, you know, to understand God had a plan. The plan was the sacrifice of his son. His blood was going to be shed to do away with all the blood that would yes. be that was being shed, and now for us to just have the gift, yeah, yeah, the gift that will not stop giving, and it's there. All we have to do is accept it. I love it. I love it. Can you hear me, Doc? Can you hear me right now? Yeah. You hear me? Okay. Good. 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 I'm over here playing with buttons. I want to make sure you still hear me. You know, yeah, yeah. the last thing, and you know, we're gonna go ahead and and uh, I'm gonna pick up the next one. You know, we don't kill goats and stuff but unfortunately <laughs> we may like a lot of other churches assassinate individuals by the way we treat them and we yes. gotta make sure that if like my homeboy he reminded me of something I told him if, if there's gonna be a problem make sure it's not because of you if there's gonna be a problem you make sure you handle your business and it ain't you it's somebody else uh, so yeah, I love it. Let's go ahead. Let's get back into the word. Uh, let's see. So we just finished up number 12. So let's go to 13. So does a person have any role at all to play <clears throat> in becoming righteous by faith? Do they have any role to play? Right. So look at the Bible says Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does what? The will of my father in heaven. So the catch is. You have to make sure that if you're going to be righteous by faith, because uh, you, you got to do his will. So I got to come back to this. So when you have this sacrifice, this animal that represents Christ, that, that basically symbolically teaches us what Jesus went through, you get his righteousness and you get it because you have faith in the fact that he's going to be successful and he's going to, uh, be this sacrifice for you, right? Now, for us, we look back and we say he has already done all that. But my point is, you get his righteousness. So is there anything that we have to do to get his righteousness? Well, yeah, you got to accept the sacrifice, right? But what the scripture points out that we just saw, Matthew 7, 21, that is you have to make sure you do the will of his father, the father. So it reminds me of... Um, um, somebody I was talking to one of the members about maybe six weeks ago, and they said, 
you know, what's the what's the deal with all these people calling themselves prophets and apostles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, look, how are you gonna be called an apostle? You ain't doing the will of God. I mean, that's that's standard. That's standard following God. So you're gonna put a title on. You know what I'm saying? So you you're gonna put a title. So how in the world is it that you're gonna call yourself an apostle and you ain't doing the will of God? I mean, you you done lost your mind. I don't I don't know who you think I am. I, I was born, but it wasn't yesterday. You call yourself all these great things and you don't even do the will of God. I'm striving to do the will of God and you ain't even surpassed me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm just everyday nobody trying to just live right. And you call yourself an apostle. You know, you call yourself Bishop so-and-so. Well, not Bishop, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> that, that's a nickname. That's a nickname. That's a nickname. He ain't no real Bishop, right? He, you know, but you know what I'm saying? But you know, oh man, that one came out bad. <laughs> but I mean, you know what I'm saying? You got all these people who with all these names in church, like they this, that, and the other, and they claiming to be from God. You know, God came, man, please, you ain't even doing the will of God. So uh, the bottom line is you got to make sure that you actually do the will of God to have that. So you can have that righteousness by faith, but you there is something you got to do. You got to live right. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead. Let's look at uh, number 14, the day of atonement. And the, and the question is, what was the day of atonement? Now, this was a particular day in the Hebrew system. Once a year on the day of atonement, they had a solemn day of judgment taking place in, in Israel. And you see the scripture right there. They had to all confess their sins. And if you refuse to con confess your sins, you were cut off from the camp forever. Right. So l let's make sure we clear with that. That one day of the year, everybody had to have it confessed. And if you didn't have it confessed, you were cut off from everybody. All right. So that's what the day of atonement was, was all about. But look, then we have two goats were selected. One was the Lord's goat. The other one was called the scapegoat. Was called the what? It's called the scapegoat. And, and that scapegoat represented Satan. So what we got is we got one represents the Lord and the other one represents the scapegoat. So the one that represents the Lord is the one that pays for your sins. The scapegoat is the one that takes the blame for your sins, right? And so what would happen is they would go ahead and they would sacrifice. And let me just stick to the lesson because I'll get ahead and I don't, I don't want to get off topic. But basically what happens is the Lord's goat was the one slain and offered for the sins of the people. Remember we said that his was the one that paid for the sins, but um, on this day, the blood was taken into the most holy place and it was sprinkled upon the, 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 uh, the mercy seat. And only on this special day of judgment did the high priest enter into the most holy place um, to meet God at the mercy seat. All right. So long story short, he would go through these, these, these different methods and steps. And at the end of the day, after all the sins had been confessed and forgiven, that blood was put on that scapegoat and they took that goat, which represented Satan. He had to, he was the one to blame for everything, the death of Christ and all the sin in the world. He was led out into the wilderness by a strong man. Cause you know, a goat, they can be, they can be pretty honorary. And you lead him out in the middle of nowhere and just leave him, let him die. No food, no nothing. And that's, that's teaching us something. We talked about that last week. We talked about the 1000 years and what's going to happen to the devil during that 1000 years. That's basically taught right there. Right. So, you know, it's an interesting concept, but let's look at our next question. Our next question is what did the day of atonement symbolize or foreshadow? What did it symbolize or foreshadow uh, a part of God's great plan of salvation? And did the other facets of the earthly sanctuary and, and its services? All right. I'm sorry. As did the other facets of the earthly sanctuary. So it was necessary that the copies of things in heaven should be purified with, with these but the heavenly things themselves with much better, better sacrifices than these. Now, that's a good thing. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to really be able to get into it like I want to, but essentially the sanctuary was teaching us stuff that would happen in heaven, not just about salvation. So for example, something I read in Hebrews the other day um, about the sanctuary. So what the Bible does, it says that there were three different compartment, two different compartments to the sanctuary, to the Moses sanctuary, the holy place, most holy place. Furniture was in this part, furniture was in that part. And the priest would always enter into the holy place every day, every day, bringing blood, bringing bread. They would do all that, right? But then once a time, once a year, they go into that other place. 
And this is uh, Hebrews chapter 8. And they go into the most holy place. And they always had to have blood to go in there. And the priest was offering up his sacrifices uh, the, for his own sins and for the sins of the people. And so what is being taught here when it says that is it saying, and it, you got to read this in Hebrews 8. It says, the Holy Spirit was showing us that the way to the most holy place up in heaven had not happened as of yet. Simply because what happened, Jesus, the tabernacle was standing and Jesus hadn't come yet. So, so the concept is, even though we look back and we see, okay, yes, that it was necessary that the copies of things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with what better sacrifices than these, God is trying to show us, yes, that, uh, I want you to realize that there's something coming and I got something better for you, but I need you to go ahead and I need you to see it. All right. So I got one more. Let's go to our next one. Our next one that we have is our last one. I think is, Oh yeah, that's it. Wait a minute. 16. That's it. All right. Hey, so look, what we can do is we'll go ahead and we'll take some final comments. Aaron, I'm going to start with you and then we'll just go down to Bishop and then myself and I'll close this on out. Uh, we're doing good on time. So Aaron, let me go ahead and unmute you. Go ahead, doc. I, I I think um, what 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 when you was when you was explaining that that, that brought me to remembers when Jesus died on the cross, um, and and uh, the, I think it's Josephus said that the high priest ran out of the temple and saying Ichabod Ichabod, because if you remember that angel came and split that uh the the veil, so you know when you look at all that symbolized that the true Lamb of God that came and died. You know that just blew my mind. I was looking at this little lamb, and and when 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 with the great uh, Josephus said, you know, it just blew my mind. And I think Ichabod means the glory of God has departed from this place. You know, so I think with that, that just blows my mind. When Jesus fulfilled it, all this stuff symbolized him was symbolized. And then in eighty thirty one, when he said it's finished, all this stuff was done. It, he 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 fulfilled uh, this this service for us. Now we can instead of me coming to the priest. I can come boldly to the throne of God. You know, that's just, that just awesome. That's awesome to me. I love it. I love it. So let's go ahead and let's look at what, uh, Bishop, what you got to say. Talk to us. Yeah, looking at what we've studied uh, this evening, it's it's more of a, a understanding for me now to see the different uh, aspects of the holy place. You know, you've, you've got this altar where where the animals are being sacrificed. You've got the laver where you can wash up a little bit. You've got the, the table where the bread is laid. You, you've got the candlesticks. And that, that makes me think of, uh, uh, of home. You know, when, when you go to someone's house to have dinner, you know, and you walk into the dining room, there's a, a buffet with, with maybe a candle holder on it. And then you've got, you know, the, the table itself. And then, you know, hey, they want you to, to take off your shoes or, or go to the restroom first and wash your hands and, and just associating those things within the holy place with the, the process, uh, the, the plan of action. And, you know, hey, the, the table is where it's all laid for you. You know, the, the focus is on the table. The focus is on what's on the table. You know, you see your, your dishes that are set up with the, with the collard greens and the candy yams and the, 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 the spread with the, the vegan meat plate. And then you've got the big turkey laid out there or some roast or something, you know, and, and the focus is on the table and everybody wants to taste the bread. And if we look at the representation of the bread being Jesus himself to say that he was the sacrifice. So there's no more blood. The table is laid. All we have to do is take a piece of the bread and enjoy it to say that this is what it's going to be like. That sounds good. It's, it's dinner time too. Lord have mercy. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> but I mean, that, that's, that's, that's good stuff right there when you think about it. Man, God's got it laid out. Let me give you my last little two cents on the whole thing, and, and that is God wants to make sure that with salvation that nobody is left out. Nobody's left out. He wants us to make sure that we know that not only is, is this thing stacked in our favor, but he wants us to recognize that 
Um, he's got good things for us. And the good things that he has for us, he doesn't want us to miss. And so we got to trust his word. We got to make sure that we trust his word. We got to make sure that we follow him and do what he would ask us to do. And look, the whole thing is, is this. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That yes, the, the reward of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is forgiveness for our sins. The gift of God is cleansing us from all unrighteousness. The gift of God is treating us like we've never done anything wrong. The gift of God is, is restoring us, changing our hearts, helping us. I mean, come on, it don't get any easier than that. He provides the sacrifice. He provides the strength to then turn around and do right. He provides the ingredients you need to want to do right. He provides everything. And all you got to do is, is come to him. That is, you know, he will even help you to live right. So I don't know about you, but for me, I want everything that he's got for me. I want everything that I just said. I want the help. I want the forgiveness. I want the being treated like I never done it. I, I want the ingredients to, to, to live right. I want a, the strength. I want it all. And so my request, my prayer to you is that you will choose, that you will choose, that you will choose to serve him. And if, you're, if it's your desire to serve him, to follow him, to do what he has asked you to do, then I want you to make sure that you, you put prayer in the chat put prayer in the chat because we want to pray for you remember we said we we're praying and fasting on thursdays so we want you to pray for him i mean we want you to we want to pray for you so put prayer you want to do his will you need his help to do his will put prayer in that chat if you want bible study you want to learn more you want to look at this of course you can go into the show notes and you can pull the lesson yourself but maybe you need a little bit more put bible study and, and if you want baptism put baptism right um, but we want to make sure you have the opportunity to give yourself completely to God. Maybe you're in a whole nother city and state. And you don't know how you're going to do it. You don't worry about that. You let us do it. You let us know, go to abneychapel.org and you can even, there's a prayer request part that's over there on the left side. You can fill it out. It comes directly to me into our prayer ministry. So look, if you do that, there's no excuse, but we want to make sure that we are there for you. So let's go ahead. Let's pray. And let's um, uh, ask God to help you and work in your life some more, continue to help you. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what you've done and how you've shown us that we can make it. We also see, Lord, how you care for us. And so, Lord, we ask that you will help us to do your will, that you will help us to want to do your will, that you will help us to help others to do your will, that you will save us. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for providing everything. You are the remedy. Jesus is the answer. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Uh, remember, we meet here every Wednesday, 7 p.m. And on Saturdays, at what time? 11 a.m. So we're here virtually, but we're in the building. We're back in the building uh, at uh, on Saturdays at 9.30 and at 11, right? So you can go ahead and you can join us there in person. Hey, God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful week. We will see you this Saturday, this Sabbath. Have an awesome time. God